Shabbat Shalom Mishpacha. Okay, our Pashas today is going to be Pashas Naso, and that is in the book of Numbers, chapters 4, verse 21. And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Take also the sum of the sons of Gershon throughout the Batim, throughout their houses, of their Ahavot, their fathers, by their Mishpachot, by their families. From thirty years old and upward until fifty years old shall you number them, all that enter in to perform the service to do the work in the tents of the appointed times. Now Gershon was a son of Levi, one of the sons of Levi, and he obviously is also a descendant of the tribes of the Levim. And uh, his children were responsible for certain duties of the tabernacle to to do the service of the appointed place of the meeting where the tent as known as a tabernacle was put down and where God's power or presence I say both power and presence came to be and the children of Israel saw the power and the presence of God there. So this particular Pasha speaks about about the ages at which they are responsible. From 30 years old they start to become the people of duty for the tent and until 50 and at 50 then they can leave or as you can call it retirement for them and then they can go and do other other things in their life. So this Pasha particularly, at least in this particular chapter, speaks about that particular aspect. But then was uh, then the next chapter five, where it says, and Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Command the children of Israel that they put outside of the camp every leper, everyone that has a discharge, and whosoever is defiled by the dead. Now in simplicity and looking at it in the proper context, both in the ancient times and the present times, you know, there were people who who basically got the disease known as leprosy in the ancient times. And it was an infectious disease. It could spread very rapidly from person to person. So those people were separated and put away until they were healed. The causes of, of leprosy we spoke about, it was medzora. Medzora meaning that those pe- people, those particular individuals did certain things wrong in society. And those things I already mentioned in my previous lectures was things like, you know, they took a false oath. They took an oath, but they never, when I say a false oath, maybe they took it in, in sincerity, but they never kept that oath. They broke it. So I don't mean that they took it false by deliberate uh, deliberate intent. When I say they, they, they simply means that they took an oath, perhaps the intent was right, but they never carried it out. And they never carried, the only reason a person doesn't carry out the oath is not because he uh, he has issues regarding financial issues. It could be a severe it's a result of what I call deliberate intent, meaning that the only time that you don't complete an oath when you deliberately don't want to. It means that it's nothing to do with money, it's not to do with your original intent, but you do not value the name of God and the word of God, that is the Torah. You basically start playing games, you know, you start to play games, you say, well, you know, I think that this law should be like this, and another law should be interpreted like that. So you start to become, uh, instead of receiving the law, Kabbalah Torah, instead of receiving it, you become the judge of the Torah. You start to play with it. And Torah is both, it's a double-edged sword. It's fire and it's a double-edged sword. It's both a fire and a sword. So how does that does that affect people? The way it affects people is that 
if you take a double-edged sword and you hold it wrong, it can cut both ways, go blade on both sides. Fire can be good for you and fire can also kill you. A couple of days ago, we had a real heavy rain where I am in Ohio and in the same street where I am, I was outside taking a little video of the rain and then whilst I was taking a video of the rain, uh, the you know the the sky it was it was pretty you know pretty heavy rain at the time. Then suddenly you know there was a big blast you know from the sky, a big noise in the wind, and what happened? There was lightning that struck in our street. The lightning struck a house, and it burned the house. This actually happened here, right in the street where I am. But an interesting thing is this, that I've been coming to this area now for maybe three years, possibly, if not longer. And we've had, you know, several instances in this surrounding area where we've had thunderstorms, where we've had uh, tornadoes, we had all sorts of things going on. But one thing never happens is with the dwelling I'm in, it never gets touched. It never is touched. And I said it, I said it once and I'll say it again. It will never be touched. It doesn't matter what house burns next to us. But you see, God knows who is the guilty and God knows who is the one who brings blessings into the house. That's very important for you to understand. And there are things that occur over here in this country and maybe in people's lives that I probably you know can't even tell you a lot of the things that happen privately because they are private stories and they are not to be broadcast on public forums but there are people who, who get blessed and there are people who get cursed this is why when I said that when it says command the children of Israel that they put outside the camp every leper it doesn't necessarily mean every leper as in every diseased person in that particular sense in spirituality it also means that every person that breaks an oath every person that's a slanderer every person that is a wrongdoer and it says everyone that has a discharge and whoever is defiled by the dead defiling by the dead means that you have been sitting with people who technically you know they they look they're like living people they look like every other person but their ideas their thoughts their behavior is not of god in other words they do not live by what we could possibly call god's way of living they are dead in that sense that they are spiritually dead they do not impart good knowledge to you they do not impart good information to you it is like sitting you know if you go back to your youth and if you are a youth you know you can relate to this even now if you sit with people who do wrong that could be people who maybe sell drugs maybe people who do criminal activity maybe people who do wrong things you know that their karma is going to return back to them the same thing that they are doing to others if they are you know if they are perhaps shooting other people perhaps doing involved in murder perhaps they are involved in drug trafficking perhaps they are involved in other things in which other people's lives are destroyed then that will come back to them they will also find that their own life will be at some point be destroyed and be affected and it doesn't necessarily have to be them directly it could affect a family member it could affect people that they love in their family mother father brother sister wife husband children that's what it means to be defiled by the dead so this is why it is important at times for us as the kohanim to remove people of that type when i mean they're not technically uh, they're not, you know, God forbid, rapists, murderers as such. But when people break oaths, they do not have to be murderers and rapists. They still have to be removed from the camp because they defile the camp. 
because they bring their wrong ideas, their wrong philosophies, their wrong teachings, and they defile the camp. They have to be ultimately removed swiftly so that the camp can remain clean. And that's something very difficult to describe and very difficult to explain to everybody because it's not easy to 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 teach the laws of the Torah. It's not easy to teach them because people come and go like yo-yo. They, you know, one minute they are here and the next minute they are gone. And they treat Torah like a game. Torah is not a game. Torah is not a game. It is a fire. It can either purify you and bless you or it will burn you. So it will do one or two things. And if you don't obey the laws of the Torah and if you take it upon yourself and you say, I'm going to do them, and then you don't do them for whatever reason, whatever excuse, because you met, you know, Joe on the street and he said, no, 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 the, the times have passed and we don't have to do this. See, there are people like that in the world. And there are people who fall into that influence. And doesn't matter the reason, you will pay the price one way or the other. That is Torah law. Law will always win. The law will never be defeated. And this is something that is very difficult to explain. I cannot debate with you of why. And I cannot debate with you and tell you who. Or I cannot tell you what for. You see, we cannot debate these things out. I cannot convince you by saying that, look at my faith, how strong it is. I cannot tell you what God did to me and why and how he blessed me. All those things absolutely matter not. Because when you are on the wrong path, debating with you is the worst thing that can happen. It's best for people like me in my camp, in my shoes, to say, get out of here, get rid of you quickly as possible. That's what I do and that's, that's what I'm here for now. So this is why this forum is no longer going to be a forum where we say, oh, please come and learn Torah, please come and join our group. We don't need that. And all those days are gone. I want to tell you a little story. As this story comes from the Bible, and it, this comes from the era of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a king in Iraq, ancient Iraq. And it says, and Nebuchadnezzar said in, in book of Daniel chapter 3 verse 28, it says here, Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the Elohim of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. What is the story behind there? These three lads, they were three Hebrew men, children of Israel in Iraq. They worshipped God. They did everything right. They were festival keepers, Sabbath keepers, tithe doers, zadaka givers. They were right in every way possible. Now the king built a huge golden statue and he asked the people of his kingdom that everybody bow to the idol, this particular statue. And these three lads were called up to make an example of the people that were in the land because these were like, you know, considered foreigners who were brought, you know, in the conquest of Israel through Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar wanted to show that he has more power and authority and uh, even though Nebuchadnezzar had great relationship with Daniel the prophet, but Daniel the prophet wasn't around at the time. He was somewhere else. But by the way, Ezekiel the prophet was around. But he wasn't at this particular function. But these three men went to, went to Ezekiel the prophet. This is absolutely amazing. And not, most of you probably don't even know this. Because it doesn't tell you there that this what happened. So they went to Ezekiel the prophet, and Ezekiel the prophet was a Kohen in the gate at the time. Daniel wasn't a Kohen. Daniel was just a prophet. So Ezekiel was not only a prophet, he was a Kohen as well in the gate at the time. And they said to him, what shall we do? The king has asked us to bow before the statue. So the, the Kohen turned around and said, you can bow before the statue, and there is nothing untowards it. God will not punish you for that. But it is entirely up to you. Because if you bow, then it will seem like you have given in to the king. And he will make an example of you by saying that, see, everybody is under my authority. And if you don't, then God is with you. So they asked Ezekiel, they said, what shall we do? Because if we bow down, then it's like we've given in to the king. 
but we serve a higher king. And if we don't, then we serve the higher king. Will he save us? So then Ezekiel, right there, Ezekiel asked God, he said, what shall I answer these men that have come here today? What shall I tell them that they should do? Should they bow? Should they not bow? And God remained silent. Ezekiel, by the way, was a prophet of magnanimous proportions. Yet God remained silent. God did not answer Ezekiel the prophet. Imagine that. God just remained silent. He did not answer him through his angels or by himself. When Ezekiel asked the question, God did not say yes. God did not say no. And Ezekiel turned around and said to the lads, to the three men, he said, God has remained silent. I'm sorry, I cannot answer you yes. I cannot answer you no. Now the rest is up to you, what you decide. They went away. They decided that they are not going to bow down before this idol. There was no debate. There was no uh, you know, discussion of whether the Torah is king, whether Torah law still exists in, in Iraq, or whether Torah law is now finished because they are no longer in the land of Israel. See, a lot of you people out there in America and other countries of the world, you question that. And it's a shameful thing to even ask such a question. It's absolutely shameful to even break an oath. And yet people do that. So these three guys, they said, you know what? Yes, Nebuchadnezzar might be powerful. And yes, he brought us over here. He brought our forefathers here in slavery. You know, he put, put chains around their neck and brought them, dragged them from Israel. Because, you know, they did wrong against the God of Israel. Remember I said to you, Torah is fire. If you go against fire, it will burn you. Don't think that you're clever and you're going to get away with it. You break an oath, you're going to pay the price. That's the short. So, they then go and they say, Well, Nebuchadnezzar is a great king in his land. Who cares? We serve even a greater king above and we are going to serve him no matter what. Even if our life goes, we will give our life because we are not going to make a public spectacle of our God and us by bowing down to this statue. There's no way we're going to do that. And they wanted to talk to uh, Daniel, but Daniel wasn't around. But they already discussed it with the Kohen. The Kohen said, look, you know, if you did bow down to the statue, it's not idol worship. Don't worry about it. It's not idol worship. But if you want me to inquire of God, I can do that and see what God says. And God said nothing. So he said, now it's up to you. What that basically meant is that God did not approve of it and God did not deny it either because he left it to their free will. What do they think? What do my people think? Do I need to show another sign to them to convince them? Do I need to debate with them that Torah is still low? Torah is still mighty? Doesn't matter where you live? No, God did not debate with them. God did not use Ezekiel to debate, to discuss or to even part with his word. He felt there was no need to part with his word. And God said, there is no need to part with any word. These people already know. They have heard of the signs that I did in Egypt. So why should they have to ask me again and again the same thing? So he, did, he remained silent. And, I, and I'll tell you the rest of the story in a second of what happened with Ezekiel and God after that scenario. And so, so these three were there and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Iraq, he wanted to make an example of them. He raised up the fire even more. He said, raise up the fire even more. And you know, his people, some of his people, while they were raising this fire, which is in the ground, they built, they built a big pit. And they, the, they keep, kept putting stuff into it till it really raised up. And they wanted to throw these three men in the fire because they refused to bow before the king. It became known that these three men, they refused to bow before the king. They said, no way, we're not buying before the king. And so they put them, and some of King Nebuchadnezzar's own men died because a fire caught them while the fire was going up and they were very close to the heat and they got caught up and they died. And so then they threw these men into the fire and everybody expected them to burn to cinders. But guess what? An angel came. An angel came down and he cooled the fire in so the fire was hot outside, 
but inside the fire it was it was cool as a fridge like you make your ice in the fridge it was so cool and he just plucked these people he was you know walking with these people in the fire and Nebuchadnezzar saw that and Nebuchadnezzar was like what the heck you know these men are in the fire and they're not burning how come they're still alive and I see another man there and so they you know then he had the fire put out and brought these men out and guess what they, these these men were completely unharmed their clothes were not even burnt so everybody in the kingdom saw a miracle and Nebuchadnezzar then bowed down publicly and said the exact words I just said to you earlier he said praise be the Elohim praise be the God of Shadrach Mashiach and Avednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants wow that is Torah my friends that is the power of God. That is the power of belief. And that is the power of faith. How many of you have that power? I doubt very much that many of you even are come close to that power. Because you are still stuck in your debates and discussions. Is Torah law? Is it not law? Should I do it? Should I not do it? You are still stuck in that debate. But there is no debate left. There is no discussions. What is law is law. What is Torah is Torah. No one can change it. God is God. God cannot be changed. God doesn't change. God's word never changes. We have in the book of Proverbs, chapter 10, verse 9, that says, Whoever walks in integrity, walks securely. Meaning, whoever walks in Torah, will never have a problem. He walks securely. But whoever takes crooked paths, will be found out. Whoever tries to manipulate, and think that he knows better, that he's now going to modify, or he's going to, you know, test the Torah or he thinks some laws are done away with and some are not, you know, walking the Christian path. Christians do that, by the way, you know, in due respect. They do that. They say, well, this law is now done away and I don't have to do this. Well, they never took an oath. They never stood at Mount Sinai. So it doesn't really apply to them anyway. So if you're going to take a crooked path, guess what? Torah is fire. Torah will burn you. And therefore I leave it with that. I think that this is enough for you to know that Torah is always going to be king. No one can judge the Torah. No one can measure it. Baruch Hashem, may the God of Israel be praised forever and ever. And all those that hear and all those that, all those that do will be blessed forever and ever. With that, I thank you. And I pass it to Rabbi Kifa. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Okay, Shalom Mishpaha, this is Rabbi Kifa coming in from home base here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, my desire is that you had a great six days of labor past and that uh, you have an awesome Shabbat as well and a great six days of labor going forward as we continue to grow and learn and continue to understand uh, uh, within us uh, who we really are. I think this is one of the key things that we need to understand going through this life is that uh, one of the key things that I would like for you all to take away from this particular uh, lecture, this particular uh, talk, is this, is that, uh, and, I, and I really want you to think about this and really meditate on this in six days of labor and even Shabbat as well in, in your time of rest and relaxation and remembrance, is that key word remember. It's, it's very key that we remember who we are. And I, and I know that's been a driving force amongst all of you here in this room, um, listening in uh, to this uh, particular lecture, regardless of your religious affiliation, is we all question within ourselves who we are. And the, the goal and the key is, as I stated earlier, is to remember who we are. Ask ourselves that question, remember who we are, because until we know who we are, and we remember who we are because let's face it the majority of us we we've lost that we've lost that very we've lost that <laughs> a lot of us to this day are still trying to figure out really who we are but when you the individual self find out who you are and you remember who you are because it's going to have to come to your remembrance yes you will be given all kind of assistance in your journey in this avatar body to assist you to aid you in finding out who you are. But at the end of the day, that's the key thing that we must do. 
on this earth right now in these bodies that we're in right now is remember who we are and don't just settle for what other people say but for you to do the study for you to do the research on your own and come into an understanding of self you know how Cohen has done a wonderful job and a great a great assistance and again he's one of those tools to help us understand who we are but again we as individuals must do our own study our own research to help us realize and remember who we are so then we can go from there and be the great human beings be the the gods and goddesses that we truly are you know but again that that all takes place within you know if you really want to get out the first step to getting out is to get in wow that's heavy stuff right it's deep when you begin to look at it and understand it and begin to continue to understand it and become a student of self when you become a student of self yourself will begin to tell you that you must remember uh, will aid and assist you to remember who you are because a lot of times all you hear is that oh we forgot this we forgot that or forgot 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 i don't know i have no clue but it's that remembrance and believe me within us as as these powerful beings that we are in these avatar bodies we have some cool equipment within inside of us eternally to help us the dna stores all kinds of loads of memory but we just have to have the tools to recall that memory now what assists us with that i tell you another thing this is beautiful another thing that will assist us is another m word is the meditation this is why you know how Cohen is really guiding and assisting individuals, the family, into meditation because that meditation is going to help you recall that memory. And the powers that be and all these other things that's going on around us in this avatar world, in this matrix that we're in, they're 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 they're, they're fighting against you remembering. They don't want you to remember who you are, and they're doing all kind of things, man. There's a lot of things going on. That they're doing and you see it all around you to to, to assist them and in, in assisting you not to remember <laughs> so understand that going forward but when we look at this parsha this is where we are with this parsha i tell you with this parsha we look at this parsha according to uh hanak's calendar which is followed by probably the majority of the people listening in and if not you know uh, and, and, uh, you know follow what you like and you desire for yourselves but when we look at Bimid Bar, when we look at uh, the book of Numbers, the beginning of the book of Numbers, here in the Torah of Moses, we see uh, Bimid Bar is in the wilderness. And this is a key takeaway that I'd like to leave you with as well. Another key point. Remember what's taking place here during this time with the, with the Hebrews here is that They've been taken in by the God of the Hebrews to where? To the desert. Not to a five-star hotel, but they've been taken on a journey into the desert. The desert is a great place. Embrace your desert. I mean, the desert is a great place because this is when you get structure. This is when you you can establish yourselves and begin to uh, establish a base of, uh, yeah, it would remembrance for the hebrews remembrance for us but uh, uh, of a regiment of order and of of, of of law that wants to that 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 needs to be established because you don't need to be in the wilderness chaotic there needs to be order and structure and this is why the wilderness is important or the desert if you want to say people look see look at the desert and the first thing they associate with the desert is probably if I would ask you, you'd probably say camels, and then the next thing we're probably saying, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then the next thing would probably be sun, you know, the sun, the sand, and the desert, and, 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 and a camel, you know what I mean, in the desert. But the desert is a great place for you to begin to organize. And this is what we see happening in, in the mid bars. We see organization occurring in the desert. So embrace the desert. The desert is a great place to be because if you really begin to look within self, you can really, you know, the desert for the most part is a 
it, when you look at it and you, you know, if any of you watched any kind of movies with, you know, desert scenes in them, you see it's, it, it's, it's, it's maybe quiet or a, a lonesome place, a place of uh, low visibility where, you know, there's nothing going on around you, but just sand <laughs> and maybe some camels passing by every now and then. But, you know, as far as you can see, it's just sand. Maybe a few little dunes and, and mountains or something like that. But, you know, no three, four-star hotels around. You know, no fast food joints on the corner. No, none of that's going on. So, it, 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 it you know, those desert times, you know, some people see them as, as lonely times. But those times are actually times when you can really begin to establish yourself and who you are and who you want to be. And to set up, like we stated earlier, set up some structure, set up some order, get things put in place so that you can navigate the desert, you see. And this is why, you know, we, 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 we have within the universal principles and the universal laws and the, you know, the laws of, of, of everything, we, you have up and down, you have right and left, you have good and bad, you have happy and sad, you know, you have... You, you have these times where you you, you utilize, you, you don't get caught up in the environment that you're in, but you focus more on, on yourself, you know, organization of self, fixing yourself. So it doesn't matter what climate or what environment you're placed in. You will be successful and you will succeed God, gods and goddesses because that's who you are. You know, don't, uh, don't, don't, don't be stymied. Or, or don't be weakened or lessened just by the particular circumstance or the particular environment. Too many times people focus on the environment when they can utilize, when they need to learn the lesson from the environment that you're in to strengthen yourself, the inner man, the inner woman, the inner God, the inner goddess that's within you to, to you know, organize yourself. So it doesn't matter what, what, what may come, what may come or go. That doesn't concern you because you know you're you're solidified or you're 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 solid on the inside so <laughs> it shouldn't it, it, it should nothing should phase you but because people are superficial you know you, you as a student of human nature you see a lot of people are superficial is that they're they're dictated by their circumstances and their environment you know but what they the things they see occur happening around them and they, they feel like, you know, if nothing happened in and around them, then there's nothing going on. Why? It's because they haven't established that particular relationship within themselves to be able to understand that, you know, there's more to life than just these occurrences or these events that's happening in, in my life. You know, I'm, I'm looking within and I'm repairing within and I'm fixing within myself so that I can escape, so that I can, you know, free myself. And I'll say this, and it's very important to understand, is that, you know, consciousness is just step one. That's just step one. When you become conscious, when you, you know, stop walking around like a zombie and you become conscious, that's just step one. That's not the all in all. Then we must move on from the consciousness and then develop ourselves in consciousness so that we can free ourselves and become free. And become free. In, a, in whatever environment, see, when you're free, it doesn't matter what environment you're in. It doesn't matter what circumstance you're in. You're still free. And then you begin to develop tools within yourself to navigate through whatever is going on around you. And, and to see it in a different perspective and don't just see it as on the surface or superficial. You're not just looking at what's on the surface. You're, you're, you're diving deeper and you're realizing, OK, you know, this may be going on the outside. But I'm not going to allow that to affect my inside in no kind of way because I'm in control. You see, this is what desert does to you. You placed out in the desert and you're forced to, you know, fight or flight, put yourself in control and, 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 and fight, you know, and fight and struggle to survive or, or fly away and just let go and release yourselves and to succumb to the particular environment that you're in, the desert climate and to the desert environment. And to the, the 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 desert, you know, the desert uh, 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 animals and things like that that are out there, because there's snakes and and scorpions out there that you can be bitten and 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 you know 
it can be lethal. You know what I mean? So, you know, we have to examine these things going forward and 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 understand something. This is a great lesson here in the Midbar because you, you see that, the, you know, the Hebrews just weren't taken in, you know, from out of bondage right into, you know, bougie. <laughs> you know, that that's the title of a great lecture, from bondage to bougie. No, they wasn't taken right out of bondage into bougie. They were taken right out of bondage, you know, and into a desert and situation and environment so that they begin to, you know, seek out and search themselves and, and find and, and establish a relationship with themselves and, and come out of that and free themselves from that, 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 that slave-like mentality, you see? The slave self to a free self, you know what I mean? And that takes time, and that takes some wandering in the deserts, in the wildernesses. These are great experiences, and embrace those experiences as great, because they are they're great environments for you to be in to, to really, you know, uh, um, um, you know, judge yourselves and see, you know, the growth in yourselves or see where you need to improve and, and to see where your strengths are. You see, when you're in these particular situations, you know, your strengths will shine. And then your weaknesses will also at the same time be exposed. You know what I mean? You know, I'm here in Texas. I'm here in San Antonio where 70 miles away, you know, they had an event that occurred in the school, the Uvalde shooting and all that. You know, you have individuals that all around me that are just talking about, you know, how, you know, gossiping about the event Monday morning quarterback in the event. I don't have time for that. And I sit there and tell them to their face, I don't want to hear I'm not going to give no energy to that, you know, that negativity. What I am going to do is infuse positivity in it. You know, this should be a, a time where you should be grateful and thankful that you have, you know, your family members around you that you can go home and hug. I can go home and give Nakshan a hug. I can go home and give thanks that he still has life within him. But I'm not going to give energy to the negative energy out there. And I'm not going to sit here and Monday morning quarterback or just to sit and talk about, you know, the event because you and I both know at many different levels, you know, these things happen for a reason. Many, you know, the cycles of these things occurring and it happens for reasons. And it's unfortunate that, you know, innocent individuals, you know, have to, you know, transition on to the next life behind, you know, uh, agendas. You know what I mean? And so I'm just not going to get all caught up in that. I'm just going to keep it moving forward. You see, I'm not going to allow the particular kind of environment or the situation to dictate uh, uh, how I am going to be within my inner man and my inner self and how I'm going to project myself out to the world that's around me. Because, you know, you can quickly find, and see, this is how they get you. You can quickly find yourself becoming fearful or becoming hateful with the, the situation that happened. I mean, you just notice that everybody's kind of afraid and also hate the cops at the same time because of what they didn't do. And then so now every, all cops are clumped up into the same environment of being, you know, these worthless individuals when they're not, you know, not all of them are. It's just that, you know, again, <laughs> you know, things happen for reasons that sometimes people don't understand. But a lot of folks want to quick to get in a judgment seat when they don't have the full picture laid out before. them. You know what I mean? So I encourage all those people around me and my environment to give thanks and to have a appreciation for their families and, and give thanks and show gratitude towards their, their children that they do have. That that you know that that's the focus. You know, let's not focus on the dead. Let's let's not focus on the dead. Let's let's focus on the people who are still alive and that are around us and how we can improve our relationships. You know what I mean? So that's where I, I put all the focus on. So I love I love you all and I leave you uh in, in peace, love, and joy and happiness and that you continue to, you know, draw closer to, you know, uh, that that the divine presence that's within you, the the awesome presence that's within you. So I say Shabbat Shalom and Shalom Shalom to all of you, you you gods and goddesses, and and and, and I love you, I love you all. So on that note, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up for this Shabbat. And uh, take care, take everything to head, take it to heart, but take it inside yourself. And that's where we're going to continue to go. And that's, this is where we're going to get better. You're not going to get better complaining about things that you have no control over. The only thing you can control is yourself and your environment around you. You see how I took all the negativity and I infused positivity into it? 
and, and now making them reverse their thinking instead of all the hatred and the fear, but to put love in your heart because that's the key. Love is where it's at. That, that, that peace and love, that's where it's at. That is where it truly is at. And that's where everything revolves around that love. When you really begin to understand what love really is, love can permeate all darkness. It can. That's just what it does. You know, it'll it'll change your environment and the way you think. It'll change your energy and it'll elevate your energy up and not down. You see, low frequencies are fear and hatred. These are low frequencies. Who 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 wants to walk in low frequency? I don't. And I submit to you, you don't either. So. You know, take it to head, take it to heart and, and, and meditate on these things going forward to where how you can actually, you know, uh, control your environment. Peace and love and power and blessings to all.